Our deacons and ushers are gonna be passing out the elements for the Lord's Supper. I wanna invite you to be a part of our Good Friday service this Friday at 6 p.m. It's gonna be a time of celebration and commemorating. It's gonna be a little different than what you're used to within the Lord's Supper. It will be done with strictly just the elements, reading the Word of God, prayer, reflection. So I wanna encourage you to be a part of that. It's gonna be done here in the auditorium. You can do it on your own. You can do it as a family. You can partake here at the altar or other different stations we'll have around the auditorium, but it will be a time looking back at that Passover night where Jesus sat at the disciples and broke bread. Paul tells the church in Corinth, he says, when we do communion, when we do the Lord's Supper, it should be a time to examine ourselves, time to celebrate and to remind ourselves what Christ had done. So today as we're wrapping up, distributing everything, let's just take some time to pause and pray and reflect on our lives in Christ. You know, church, the, the celebration of Passover was, was big. It was a big deal to the Jewish community because it was a time that they remembered what it was like to be in slavery, that their, that their people were in bondage under Pharaoh, but the Lord was gonna deliver them. And so he went through a series of 10 plagues. The last one was the biggest one, the, plagues of the, the firstborn and they were instructed to the, a lamb, they should to kill us a, a, a perfect lamb and then take a hyssop branch and with the blood shed from that lamb, wipe it over the doorpost of their home. So as the death angel would pass through, he would pass over that home because the blood over the door. There's just a lot of symbolic truth in there, knowing that our heart is considered the door and that the blood from the lamb covering the door, that we're safe and saved. And so the, the Jews would continually, every year would celebrate Passover. And on this one particular Passover, Jesus was going to take it another step, a step that we are eternally grateful for, but he would take, make a new covenant, letting them know that the blood that he would shed would be for the forgiveness of sins. And so Luke records this in Luke 22, he says, and he took the bread, he gave it, he broke it. He gave it to him, he said, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. It says in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this is my new covenant, the blood which we poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this also in remembrance of me. Jesus was setting up a new covenant with his people that they would now remember Passover as the time where Jesus came, bled for them, but gave them eternal life, not just a chance to escape and be without slavery under man, but escape slavery from sin. Let's pray, Lord. Lord, we thank you the time to remember and to remind ourselves of the truth and the promises that come through you and your word. God, I pray that what was said and done here today would glory, glorify you. Thank you for who you are and the promises that you give. 
It's your name that we pray all these things in. Amen. Today, church, in our series on uncontainable, that Jesus himself cannot be contained. His message cannot be contained. His works cannot be contained. We look at this account that's actually one of the few accounts that are recorded in all four gospels. It says here, his, that's this triumphal entry. Now, this is not just a, a moment where people had, uh, had knew that was gonna happen. You know, nowadays when we do things, there's just like save the dates. You know, people are getting engaged and married. They send you out these cards. Of, if, hey, save the date. You know, hey, we're having a wedding shower. Here's a date. Hey, there's a birthday party. Here's an invite. Come to it. You know, those kinds of things. There was not a save the date card that went out through the mail for this. People did not wake up and go, oh, I forget, today's the day Jesus is gonna ride on the lamb. We need, do you have your palm branches ready? Yep, I got it all dusted off right here. Okay, great, because 11 o'clock, we're all supposed to gather down by the courthouse and, and celebrate Jesus coming in. It was not like that. However, the Jewish people were actually very much ready or prepared for this because they knew to the prophet Zechariah that their king would come in riding on a colt. So they, they knew of what this thing looked like, but they didn't know it was actually gonna be today or that day. So we read in John chapter 12, starting out in verse 12, it says, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, carrying out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey. He sat on it, and as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, when, then they remembered that these things were, had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this the sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see, they are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. The triumphal entry, as I said, is one of the few things that were recorded throughout all the gospels. And it was a crucial event in which Jesus dramatically displayed and presented himself as king in accordance with the prophecy to fulfill prophecy. See, Jesus was following the prophetic words of Zechariah that their king would be coming on a cult. And Jesus could have walked in, but he was proclaiming, proclaiming to everyone that yes, indeed, he was the king. See, the Jews previously wanted to make him king, but their intentions were wrong and their timing was not right. When they saw what he'd done, when they fed the 5,000, they, they gathered around and said, we want to make this guy king because look what he can do for us. Look what he can give us. Later on, they, they saw that his power and his might were displayed by healing the, the crippled man and then the man who was blind from birth. And they, 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 what they wanted, but what they needed were two different things. What they wanted was someone to come with his power and might and overthrow the Roman government. But what they needed was a savior. See, initially his disciples did not fully understand this occasion, but as it unfolded, it became more and more clear of why he was doing what he was doing and still who he was. If you're taking notes today on the back of your bulletin, the first thing is this I want us to know all today is that celebration and honor are appropriate responses when in the, his presence. Celebration and honor are appropriate responses when in his presence. The Jews began to recognize Jesus was indeed the king and they responded appropriately. See, today we gathered also recognizing that Jesus is king. Amen? But the question is, for our hearts, are we responding appropriately? How do we prepare our hearts? How do we prepare our hearts to respond to the presence of the, of the king? How would we, how should we, before we come into worship today, prepare ourselves to respond appropriately to celebrate and honor? How can we do that? Well, first thing is maybe ask ourselves the question, did we pray before we darkened the doors of the church that the Lord would speak to us today? Did we pray that today would be a day that God would speak 
answer a prayer that we've been petitioning him for or would guide us in a direction that we're needing guidance in, a way to hear from him? Or are we out of here, here today out of, out of habit? Now, I don't mean habit as being bad. Being coming to church on a regular basis is a good habit. But I think it would be better for us to maybe before we get out of the, the, the car, as we're traveling to worship, to say, Lord, I know today I will be with my brothers and sisters in your presence. And the Lord, I wanna hear from you today. God, I pray that you would speak to me, that you would strengthen me. Lord, that you would convict me in areas that do not align with you, that I may be a better father, a husband, a follower of Christ. Lord, what is it in my life that needs redirecting for who you are and for your purpose in your kingdom? Or do we just like, hey guys, we're gonna be late. And we all grab our Bibles and blow the dust off of them, get in the car and we distribute them out. Make sure you return them when we come in so we can all have them next week when we get here. I say that because that's kind of how I grew up. We had a stack of Bibles up on the coffee table and they, we put them off the shelf coming to church on Sunday morning. And when Sunday church was over with, my mom would collect them all, stack them with each other, and put them back on the, 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 the bookcase there. And we'd pick them up the next week on our way out. Sure, every once in a while we would, we'd pull them out and read them. But it was more just a habit of going to church than this knowing that we're gonna be in the presence of our brothers and sisters in Christ under the name of Jesus and expecting God to do something. I think when you come in expecting something, some people are like, well, I, just, I don't wanna have too high expectations so I'm not left disappointed. No, this is Jesus we're talking about. That's something he doesn't know how to do, which is, which is disappoint. Now, if your expectation was me and delivering a good message, you might be disappointed. If your expectation was for Darren to sing all the right words and all the right notes and everybody play the right music, you might be disappointed. But if your expectation is to hear from Jesus, that's something he doesn't know how to do, is disappoint. So when we're in his presence, celebration and honor are appropriate responses. That's how the Jews responded when they realized they're gonna be in the presence of the king. Did we, did we come today with the same expectation? Did we invite anyone to be a part of this life-changing event? Uh, several weeks ago, I got a chance to go see one of a, a, a guy that I, I love listening to his music. His name's Ben Rector. And I got to go to his concert. I, I was like, I'm getting to go to a concert tonight. I'm gonna go see Ben Rector in concert. He's gonna be at the Majestic. I told the staff, I was like, guess what? I'm gonna go. We got there. We took pictures. Oh, look, Ben Rector concert. Come to find out there's other people from our church and people from our community that we saw there. We're like, oh, you listen to this music too? I like Ben Rector. We just kind of talked about it because it was something we were doing. We had a high expectation to be a part of it. Yet when it comes to church or Bible study or being with our church family, do we have that same kind of expectation? Like, hey, it's church. Look how excited we're at church. We check in on Facebook. You know, we'd like to take a picture. Like, well, great day at church today. Missed you, wish you were here. Let everyone else know. Hey, guess what's happening? We're at church. Today's a great day. We, we commemorate all these activities. We go out somewhere. We're visiting our childhood areas. We go to a nice restaurant. We let everyone know where we're at on a Friday night. Come Sunday morning, eh, whatever. But when we're in the presence of the king, to respond appropriately is to give him honor and to celebrate, to be excited and to worship him. Do we even think that today had the potential or the chance to be life-changing? Or are we just here hoping that I won't go past 12 because we're having fried chicken and an egg hunt today? I promise you, I won't go past 12. I don't want to disappoint. Celebration and honor are appropriate responses when, it's present, when in his presence. So my charge for us is that moving forward from today and tomorrow and this week and the days to come, to know that we're not just in his presence because we're at church, but you wake up the spirit of God lives inside of you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. And you have the opportunity to there before your feet hit the ground, before you step foot in your office, before you come home for the day, you have the opportunity. You're in the presence of God Almighty to celebrate and to honor him. We pick up in, in verse 20 now. It says, now among those 
who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip and the set of Bethsidia and Galilee and asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. Now we see that there are Greeks gathering here that, that should pique our interest, that other people are gathering here, other Greeks. Some people say, well, that when they asked the disciples, you know, can we see Jesus? There was some discussion. Well, you know, should we, you know, where's Jesus? And so they go to Jesus, and say, hey, these Greeks wanna to talk to you. And Jesus responds to truly, truly, the time has now come that I will be glorified. Well, who are the Greeks? Well, obviously we don't know their names because they're, because they're not listed. But it is interesting that most scholars believe that they're, they're Jewish Greeks. Now, notice they're not there just to kind of be inquisitive of who Jesus is. Because in verse 20, it says there, now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So they're not just there being curious of Jesus. Like, hey, we hear this, this Jesus guy done some really cool things and we're here to, to, to meet him. We wanna to talk to him. No, they were already there for Passover. So we know they're a Jewish. Now this would be either A, back John, John chapter seven talks about the dispersia or those who have been dispersed, those Jews. Also Acts 6, one talks about the Hellenists. There were the Greek Jews and then there were the, <coughs> excuse me, the original Jews. And so there was this dispersion, this disagreement of who's getting served more. And so the, the apostles had deacons to come and take care of this, this issue. And so I believe with most scholars that these are the Hellenistic Jews that are gathered here and they are coming. They're Greek Jews coming to also see Jesus and they wanna spend time with him. Now, regardless of really who they are, they were, the message of Jesus was spreading so rapidly that people became more and more inquisitive of this could be or this is the Messiah. Jesus makes a profound statement in verse 24. He says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Second thing I want us to understand today is this, death brings life. Jesus said, if a grain of wheat doesn't fall, it won't reproduce. Jesus saying is that he must die so that there must be fruit, or another way of saying it is his death will bring life. The beautiful thing about this is that we can also look at this from a sanctification process, knowing that when we die to ourselves, we die to sin that trips us up or plagues us, whatever, that when we die to that, it actually brings growth in our life. There's things in our life that people, sometimes we, we choose to do or say and be involved in. We say, Lord, we know this is not for you. We know it's not from you and it inhibits my walk with you. And so we, we die to that and out of that life happens. I, I like to think of it this way. Um, we had our sprinkler system in our backyard that stopped working and we had a tree that was being watered when our sprinkler system would go off. And we didn't realize it until my wife goes, I think our tree's dying. I was like, really? And she's like, well, there's no leaves on it. I was like, that could be bad. And uh, so we started looking at it, called a friend of mine who uh, is in kind of that little area. And he's like, yeah, it sounds like to me, your tree's almost dead. You need to start putting some water on it. He goes, well, be careful when it does come back, it's gonna start trying to have new growth. And what you wanna do is you wanna cut that off so the, the part that you want, the upper part of the tree will, will grow back rather. Um, I was like, okay, that didn't make any sense to me. So I was like, whatever, I heard water the tree. So what do I do? I get out there on a regular basis and I'm watering the tree. Three or four months pass by. Now all of a sudden there starts to be some more green on the tree. I'm like, ah, oh, awesome. Except for the top part of the tree, everything was, nothing was bearing any fruit. There's no green leaves anywhere, but I had all this new growth sparting out from the trunk about four feet all the way down. 
And I was like, well, that looks ugly and I want all that to look pretty. And so I called him back up and he's like, you, you gotta trim all that away because it's gonna, it's, it's easier to grow down there than it's gonna go all the way to the top. So you gotta cut all that away so you can get nutrition to the top because it's gonna suck all the nutrition away. I was like, oh, so that time I heard him. I started cutting all these things away, got it all cleared up. And a couple, a couple of weeks later, I started seeing green at the top of the tree. See, if I, was willing, if I wasn't willing to cut away this growth, I wouldn't have growth where it needs to be. And for a lot of us, sometimes in our life, we forget that saying no to certain things, although they, they didn't really seem bad at the moment, they didn't really see, you know, distracting at the moment, but by saying, not saying no to those things, we start having new growth in areas and it distracts from where it needs to be at the top. And through killing out these branches allowed growth to be in places it need to be. Death brings life. Jesus' death brought life to us. And Jesus says, if a grain of wheat doesn't fall to the ground and die, it won't reproduce. And Jesus is saying, if I don't go to the cross and die, then I can't bring life. Now, we, look, we go on and he says in verse 32, he says this, We find 32, there he goes. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. I love that, that word, will draw, will draw. Jesus is going to say, because when he dies, there can't, there can't be life unless I die. So when I die, I can bring life. And when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to me. Jesus isn't shying away from the title of being king. He is not shying away from the title of being savior. And people are starting to pick up on that as we will find out next week. People don't always like what they hear. Verses 35 and 36, Jesus continues on and says, so Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Jesus says he's the light and he's there for just a little longer, but to walk in the opposite of him is to walk in darkness. Basically he's saying that if you walk in the light, you'll be sons of light, or if you walk in him, you'll be sons of the king, children of God. The sad thing is the reality is most people who believe in hell don't think they're going there. Which some, most people that I talk to believe they can save themselves through another way other than Christ. I talk to people, and I'm, talking about not, I'm not talking about people just outside the church. I'm talking about people within the church that I've talked to before and say, hey, so what, how will you go to heaven? You know, I'm... It's a great question, Pastor. Uh, I probably should go to heaven because I, you know, I, I tend to do the right thing. I mean, I'm in church on a regular basis. I mean, I was a small group leader once. Uh, you know, I used to serve in this area. And, uh, you know, I, I don't read my Bible as much as I should, but, you know, I, 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 I tend to, you know, read it. I, mean, I know some things. You know, I try to help people out when they're in need. And, and let me just stop right where we're at. None of those things are what are required for salvation. There are things we do because of salvation. And sometimes even within the church, you just ask a simple question, why would you go to heaven? And many people go straight to their deeds, straight to, I'm not as bad, I could be better. I, here's my church attendance. I got the award for, I literally have heard this one from an adult before. I won the award and a one is when I was a kid for memorizing the most scripture in one, one year. Like you're 48 years old, and you're attributing your salvation to stand before the eternal king to spend eternity in him and you're equating it to when you were eight, memorizing the most verses. We have missed the mark if we point to anything other than Jesus. The last point is this, only Jesus can bring people out of the darkness. Only Jesus can bring people out of darkness. 
Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes we try to work in the darkness on our own. So if the light goes out, the electricity goes out in the middle of the night, you've been in your home a hundred times, but now there's no reflection of the microwave, the, that little light that gives just enough in the living room um, where you can see. If you're in our house, you don't have to worry about that. We leave lights on all the time everywhere we are. Um, that's, we, we, we love lamps at our house. Uh, they're my favorite. Um, somebody signed me up for marriage counseling because I'm sure my wife is giving me the, the evil eye right now. But, but when you are in a dark place and you are familiar with it, you're still uncertain. So you kind of walk around like this. Little steps, so you don't go whack and cut your toe off kind of thing. But you little bitty steps, your arms, you're just kind of feeling things out. You're in a place you constantly know. You've been a thousand times, but you're still uncertainty. You're still uncertain. See, that's what like walking in the darkness is. People, they have an idea of what they should be doing, but they're still uncertain. Church, when it comes to our salvation, we should never be in a point of uncertainty. I just want to encourage you that if you have doubts, have a conversation. You say, well, I know I, I, when I was seven, I got saved, but you know, my life really hasn't reflected it right now. Okay, let's talk about it. Because maybe we are walking in darkness and not in the light. Maybe we've just allowed the light to become so less bright in our lives that we really just can't see as well as we should. Or maybe we're just so prideful, we're walking around with our eyes closed unwilling to see what we should see or change what we should change. So we just bury our head in the sand. The reality is only Jesus can bring people out of darkness. He even says this in verse 44 through 46. He said, Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but him who sent me. And whoever sees me, who sees him who sent me, I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me, in me may not remain in darkness. When life gets hard, church, where do we turn? When we need answers to our questions, where do we turn? When we feel lonely or down, where do we turn? When things are confusing or we need clarity, where do we turn? If we turn to self-help books, I want you to know, they may not be bad, but they're not as good as the word of God. If we turn to a friend, that may not be bad, but they're not as good as their heavenly father. My charge for us today is when those things happen in our life, let's turn to him first, not just a friend, not just uh, how to have self-discipline in the, in the millennial you know, as a, as a millennial or whatever, how to, how to, how to be self-disciplined in the new job or how to this. Let's, those are good. Leadership books are good. I read them all the time, but not at the expense of God's word. Friendships are awesome. I call my friends all the time, send them texts. I need help with this. Pray for me about this. But they're not better than my heavenly father. And if, I, if you're here today and you're living in darkness, the only one who can pull you out of darkness is Jesus. Others can point, others can guide, but Jesus is the only one who can bring you out of darkness. Today, we have a chance to celebrate through baptism. We, have, we did baptism in the first service, we're getting to do baptism in the second service. We have two young ladies who are making their faith public today and they're saying, Jesus has saved me, he's rescued me, and today I'm letting my faith in Jesus be known to the world, and I'll be doing that through my public declaration of baptism. So today we have Robbie and Easton. Church, if you want to face him, Easton. This is Easton. Um, she's one of our sixth grade girls, and I just want to share with you guys, she is a phenomenal leader, and she loves to have great conversation about the Bible and be so encouraging to our girls as well as our guys, but most of our girls. She's just, just a bright ray of sunshine. And Easton, it is an honor. And I'm just so blessed to be able to baptize you today. So Easton, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, King over all? Yes. Well, by that profession of faith, it's an honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. And buried with Christ, we baptize you, and raised to walk in the newness of life. We have another one, Miss Kylie Flournoy. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is Kylie, our oldest. Um, I actually had the privilege of being baptized by my dad uh, in the old building back in the 80s. Uh, so this is very special for uh, Brittany and I. Um, we have four generations here that are um, all believers in our family. Um, so not only do we have our family, but we also have the church family. Kylie's been prayed over, mentored since early before she was born in this church. So we wanna tell our church family, thank you. And that makes this doing in front of this group of people that much more special. So with that being said, Kylie, do you believe that you're a sinner? and that Jesus has paid the price for your sin, and that you accept him as your Lord and Savior. Yes. Okay. It's my privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, church, this is really an exciting thing because we get to celebrate the work that Christ has done. And Jason is hit the nail on the head. There are generations of families that have come through Boulevardy Baptist Church and, and this is fruit from that because Jesus died, he brought life and through discipleship, there's a legacy of generation after generation of knowing who he is and sharing that with other people. 